I wanted to introduce you uh, to my senior author, Dr. Sandra Khan, who's a world-class orthodontist. Sandra? Well, people always wonder why this relationship between a uh, evolutionary biologist and an orthodontist, uh, it seems a little um, awkward. But actually, uh, we were very interested, my husband and I, in conservation. And um, a, f a colleague of us, uh, a prominent conservationist uh, biologist from Mexico, he introduced us to Paul. This is uh, Dr. Ceballos. And um, we started working with our, our project Rainforest to Reef in uh, protecting jaguar habitat down in Mexico. And as our friendship grew and we started enjoying more of um, our time socially, I realized that Paul really was um, interested in, in anything that had to do with human predicament and um, environment. And so I, I introduced him to, to the, the theories that you know, the size of the jaw and the, the crowding is not necessarily just a, a, a mild problem, but it's actually something that is affecting um, humanity. It's causing a lot of misery. And Paul, with his um, amazing insight, was able to, to um, work with me and, and, and bring this to the forefront. Uh, it, the, the story, it's really a story <coughs> of gigantic environmental change, the biggest change that our species has ever gone through, and that is the change from being hunters and gatherers, which we were for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, to being industrialized and eating uh, a, uh, I should say, rather drinking a diet. Uh, gradually, as we become industrialized, we've done less and less chewing. Uh, mothers who breastfeed uh, often pump uh, because they're working during the day and their babies are fed from bottles. And bottle feeding doesn't exercise a baby's jaw the way uh, nursing does. And then we often, uh, if mothers who can nurse, uh, often don't nurse long enough. Uh, and when they wean the kids, uh, they wean them to uh, liquid foods rather than for most of our hunting and gathering days, of course, they were weaned to whatever the adults ate. So uh, we basically have a pattern of lack of use of jaws. Uh, and not only are uh, babies not given enough opportunity to chew, but right through their lives now, the kids feed on these fast food diets where just think of how liquid a hamburger is compared to a tough steak. Uh, think of uh, not eating your vegetables, but first of all, when you eat fruits, eating ones that are selected to be very soft and juicy, or as there's a trend now, to actually eat them that have been totally squished up into liquid in a smoothie. Uh, so basically we have not been exercising our jaws, and there's very good data now uh, from studies in uh, cemeteries and so on that over the last few hundred years, even that short a time, the size of the human jaw has shrunk, uh, and uh, when you shrink the jaw, and you don't shrink the teeth because there's nothing shrinking the teeth, you end up with too many teeth for the size of the jaw, you get obstruction uh, in your mouth, crooked teeth, your tongue doesn't fit, your tongue can slop back into your throat when you're lying on your back trying to sleep, and that leads to something called sleep apnea. Uh, and if you've been watching the medical literature on sleep, as you conservation biologists should be, uh, you find that sleep apnea is becoming very, very common, and it consists of waking you up or at least stopping your breathing in the middle of the night, which is a huge stressor. And again, one of the things that medicine has shown us over the last decades is how stress is connected to everything from cancer and heart disease to being killed on the highway because sleep at deprivation uh, leads to more highway accidents than drunk driving. Uh, it also leads to the chance of you being killed in a hospital because many of the interns in hospitals are sleep deprived and they're the equivalent of drunks. So uh, Sandra and I decided to bring this whole issue to the fore and focus people's attention not so much on crooked teeth, but on what small jaws do to people. And uh, that's what the, the new book that we've published called Jaws, 
does, it tells you how this epidemic started, what's causing it, how to tell if your kids are trapped in it, uh, and how, what to do if you do see signs of your kids having these problems, which doesn't mean immediately getting them braces and have somebody extract some of their teeth to make more room in their jaw. So if you have children, uh, if you're going to have children, if you ever were a child, uh, then get the book and learn about one of the really big public health threats that we're facing now. As an orthodontist, I was seeing uh, clinically patients and their families and one of the ideas that we play with a lot, uh, little Susie has mommy's small jaws and daddy's big teeth. So they get together and now they have crowding. So by having um, the evolutionary view into this, uh, this issue, we actually are able to support the fact that it, there are more env environmental aspects of this epidemic because we see we we've seen that a lot of um, people have crooked teeth. It's, it's definitely something that's on the rise, and the the sleep apnea or the not being able to breathe as well as we could when we're sleeping. And we found that there's incredible evidence that this is mostly a change that has happened environmentally, just like you know wisdom teeth. People think that, you know, because we're not eating uh, a raw diet, we don't need those molars, and that's why we are evolving out of um, developing the space for them. It's actually the environment that's causing that our jaws don't have enough room. And um, a big percentage, if not almost everybody in the industrialized world, has their wisdom teeth removed. And we've looked at it, and we realized that this is actually health risk, because if you have more teeth, you have more room for your tongue. If you have less teeth, the jaws are small, then the tongue doesn't have enough room to live inside the mouth and has to, part, part of it has to live in the throat. And that's what causes the, the blockage of the airway. The airway is a passage from your nose or your mouth into the lungs. And if the tongue partially is living in, in that tube, then you're going to start developing problems. And like Paul was explaining, uh, this traces back to children not being weaned properly, not being breastfed enough, because when you breastfeed, you're having that muscle action and you're working your, your muscles that help your jaws grow. And then from there you go, we tend to wean children into baby food that's you know almost pre-chewed. And we give them mush, and then after that we you know graduate them into macaroni and cheese and hamburgers and these are foods don't don't really demand a lot of work from the muscles. So if the muscles are not working, we don't develop the the bones as as well as we we should. And you'd, you'd rather have your kid chew gum than drink smoothies. Absolutely, absolutely. The the issue with the smoothies is also uh, a whole other um, topic that we've talked about in our book, which is that nutritionists and people that are interested in health and and um, and nutrition they are looking at the components the the chemical composition of the nutrients in our food but it, there hasn't really been anything that has informed people about the delivery or how you, you to the, these foods if you get enough you know calcium or minerals or vitamins in a smoothie that's great but if you're not chewing the fruit itself with all the fiber and not only the fiber, because you can sometimes in the smoothie include the fiber, but if you're not chewing it vigorously by your jaws, then you're not um, milking the glands, the salivary glands, you know, that when you chew hard, you have foods that are very consistent and you're chewing vigorously. The saliva has a lot of very important physiological processes that saliva is involved with, and it's not only cleaning your mouth, but it's also providing important things for the digestion of food. We have tylene and other um, uh, enzymes that go into the food when you're chewing. So chewing has been overlooked. There's been literature, you know, that's over 200 years old, where things, you know, we had looked into... Make them buy the book to see that stuff. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you should read our book because it's... It's a very short book, but it has information that really hasn't been brought to, to the public's attention. You know, we actually recall George Caitlin, who uh, 
studied and painted. He was primarily a painter. He had a short time as a, an attorney, but he was primarily a painter in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, went out and lived with Native Americans, with Indians. Uh, and he discovered that they called us not just pale faces, but also black mouths, because we always had our jaws open. They, they had low death rates related to the Europeans. Uh, and he got so persuaded that the problem was mouth breathing, uh, that he trained himself to nose breathe. And he wrote a book, and this was published around 1860. The book is called Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life. We reproduce uh, some of his pictures of uh, how to tell uh, nose breathers from mouth breathers. I mean, one of the uh, things that went along with industrialization uh, was creating fruits through genetic breeding that were very soft and squishy. So that even there, if you don't take the smoothie and you take the fruit, you're still uh, facing a small environmental change which goes in the direction of reducing your jaws. Another one is we moved indoors. What do you have indoors? Well, you have formaldehyde, you have dust mites, you have all sorts of things that create allergies. So kids tend to have stuffy noses, particularly if they uh, go to nurseries. Uh, they tend to spread them around. What happens if you have a stuffy nose? You become a mouth breather. What happens if you become a mouth breather? Your jaw development goes to hell. This was shown in a cruel set of experiments that we wouldn't approve of today, but were done some time ago, of taking monkeys, rhesus monkeys, and plugging some of their noses with plastic plugs and their jaw development just went right down the drain. Jaws got smaller and narrower in the ones with blocked noses. Another environmental change going along with industrialization that has changed our jaw development. So jaws are much more central uh, to our lives than most people would think. The second part of it, of uh, the environmental crisis, is that we're not breathing through our nose. And our nose has a very important function and, and physiologically we need to use our nose to get the air into our lungs because our nose will um, warm up the air, it will also moisturize the air, and it will also filter, as you say. If we go into a room inside, as opposed to the, the, the Native Americans that lived outdoors, we go inside and you guys have seen, you know, in a, in a warm day you see a, a ray of, of sun coming into a room and you see all those particles and we've got to filter those particles. So if we're living indoors, we tend to have more stuffy noses, and then we hang our mouth open. When we hang our mouth open, then we're not going to be growing properly. Anatomically, we have pairs, like our hands, and we grow separately, like our fingers are exactly the same size, and they grow without having to have information of each other. The jaws, we have the up top and the bottom jaw, the mandible and the maxilla, and they actually, in order to grow properly, they have to have information, so they have to be touching. So the moment we are um, opening our mouth, either because we don't have the strength, because we haven't developed it by chewing vigorously, or because our nose is stuffy, or for whatever reason we can't breathe through our nose properly and we start breathing through our mouth, then we separate our teeth, and then the information on, of the maxilla and the mandible gets broken. If they're together, they are growing together, and they both get bigger. And meet properly, which is Exactly. The and when we open our mouth, we start growing down and back. So, you know, the top jaw starts folding back. And that brings us to the part in our, in our work, the one that I'm most passionate about, and that is what to do. And we have to tell parents and any adult that has to do um, any work with children or uh, is, is in contact with children, what are the, the signs that growth is not happening, that the jaws are going in the, in the wrong direction. We need to prevent, because in order to get the jaws to grow properly, so all the teeth fit, so that we don't have any breathing problems and we, we have a more um, healthy life as adults, we need to address these problems very early. And when we're three, two, four years old, we don't really see the bad symptoms as obvious. We don't see the crooked teeth because the permanent teeth maybe haven't grown in and the baby teeth might not have enough space but might not be crowded because they're much smaller. So we need to teach these adults and parents to read the symptoms. The first symptom, like you said, 
the, the one that does bring pa parents into the office is when the children are snoring, because snoring is not normal. It's halfway to sleep apnea, basically. Yeah, and anybody that snores is going to develop sleep apnea at some point in their life if they live long enough. But we have to see this, and, and parents and doctors, uh, physicians, pediatricians, they already recognize that a child should not snore. And what they do is they, if, if they're snoring a lot, what they do is they address the tonsils and abnormal. But now I've seen with uh, Dr. Giminon's research from Stanford that actually tonsils and adenoids are secondary to mouth breathing. So the tonsils and adenoids is a tissue in the, in the back of the throat that you know starts filtering when the nose is not doing its job. They get enlarged because we're mouth breathing. It's not that they're enlarged yeah. and that's yeah. why we're mouth breathing. It's, it's the other way around. So we want to address the problem and not just a symptom. Just like orthodontics, we put braces or Invisalign on the teeth, and that's dealing with the symptom. Crooked teeth are a symptom. What are the causes of crooked teeth? The fact that the jaws didn't grow properly be because we didn't wean, and we didn't exercise, and we didn't clear our nose. And you'll find a, a very nice box in the book which lists the things you should watch for in your kids beyond snoring, things like uh, are the covers always messed up and does it look like they had a, a problem sleeping during the night uh, running around? Or uh, when they smile, do you see a lot of gum uh, or do you just see teeth? Or are there bags under the eyes or is there too much white showing? There's a whole list of symptoms that allow a parent to look at a kid, watch a kid, uh, and, uh, and decide whether or not it's time to go and do something about it. And uh, I think uh, an important point, which uh, Sandra, I think, will agree with, is that one of the problems with orthodontia today, orthodontists are perfectly reasonable people who are trying to help people, help them look better, help them live better lives, and so on, but they are making a mistake when they say, let's wait till all the teeth are in before we do something. That's too much focus on the teeth. It's true, if you want to straighten teeth, you might as well wait until the teeth that are crooked are there. You don't do it in the baby teeth. But the point is, the fact that the teeth are going to become crooked becomes clear earlier on. It's a matter of jaw growth, and the problem then is to get there early enough to influence the jaw growth, which means very early, if possible, around two years old or, or you know, in that area. Not wait till they've gone through puberty and already have tiny jaws, and then work trying to move those teeth around in a too small jaw. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm an orthodontist. I'm still passionate about my, my profession. I think it's a group of people that really are focused on doing something good for their patients. But we've introduced the term uh, forwardontics, which is really not necessarily dealing with a symptom, but doing, going to prevention and making sure we do anything that will encourage the jaws to grow forward. That's why we call it forwardontics. We'd like to have everything forward. If you look at beautiful people and healthy people, usually they have very well-defined jaws that are more forward. And people that don't breathe well or that have a lot of health issues, usually their jaws are, are, are retreated. And orthodontics, if it's not done properly, will tend to push Move everything back. back. Yeah. And you know, years ago, I hope nobody's using it anymore, but used to use the, the famous headgears that actually pushed everything back. And now we know that people that wore this when they were children, now they have very bad symptoms with their airway and a lot of problems with their joints and pain. And there's a lot of things, bad things, that will happen when things are pushed back. So forward onics is in the new group of practitioners. Could be orthodontists, could be therapists, could be anybody that is focusing on anything that will help the, the development go forward. By, by the way, in the book, this sounds very mysterious, it's really very simple. In the book you'll find lots of good illustrations, both from the outside and showing x-rays, showing what happens to the airway. You can actually see uh, yourself being snuffed out, basically, uh, if you have everything's moved back and the tongue hasn't got room in the mouth. So, uh, again, we use a lot of illustrations because these things aren't really mysterious, they're actually you know, visible to you. You can see what's happening, and you can see what's happened to somebody by looking at their profile. Yeah, I, I see people all the time, and I have 
uh, parents that have gone through our programs that see someone and they, they immediately say, oh, I'm sure you snore, I'm sure you don't sleep well, because you see them and you see their jaws all drop back and you know that their tongue doesn't have any room. And, you know, something that we know is that if jaws are too small, then the tongue starts falling back and that's when we start snoring. And if we look at the progression of snoring, eventually as we get older, we lose tone on our, on our muscles. So, you know, some, some people might have a, 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 a small jaw, but the, the problems will not manifest themselves until later in life. When we're 50, 60, that's when we start snoring really bad. And then when we're 70, we might be, you know, our tongue might be, get so relaxed at night that we stop our breathing. And you know this is something that can happen to to anyone, and it could happen early, or it could just something that progresses. And it's it's all <coughs> tied in to what we're pushing for, which is a more holistic view of medicine. We are hoping to get orthodontists, dentists, and MDs and so on working more closely together. After all, <coughs> if you're starting to snore and you're young. Uh, and that's beginning to maybe to interrupt your sleep. We also know uh, that sleep interruption, sleep deprivation makes it easier for you to become obese. Uh, and then when you become obese, that makes it easier and more likely that you're going to get sleep apnea. So these things get into, into cycles and they're, they're all connected to each other. So we think that both health professionals and people in general ought to pay more attention to the connections and particularly to prevention. It's a hell of a lot easier to prevent having problems with your jaw uh, and prevent having teeth that are moving in different directions uh, than it is to fix it. I mean, basically, if you wait too long, as those of you who have had braces know, it's not a permanent fix. If your braces move your crooked teeth back into alignment, they have to put in a retainer to keep them there because although you don't think so, bone is living material. It's always exchanging minerals and nutrients with the rest of the body. It's always building in some places and being destroyed in other places. And therefore, it's not, un not unusual for teeth to move around if they don't have space. And if they've been put in some other place, they're likely to move back. So it's a, it's a living system that's very complicated and you want to give it the proper signals, the proper environment to develop the right way and then you won't have any impacted wisdom teeth, you'll just have a mouthful of proper teeth because the wisdom teeth are just the last molars that have been crowded out because the jaw shrank. Yeah, we, we tend to, to um, blame things uh, on what we see as, as evident. Like we see somebody that's obese and we say, well, you're having this problem because you're obese. Or we see a child that cannot concentrate in school and we go, you know, you have attention de deficit, we call it a disorder. But actually, the obesity could be a, a, a response to somebody that's not being rest, rested properly, the same as the attention for a child. If they're not sleeping well, they might not be able to have the energy during the day to have the activity to not be obese or to be able to concentrate in school. So these are things that are related. There's, there's two things that I like for parents to really take home out of this talk. And, um, one of them is when you see a child, any age, newborn, with the mouth open, that is a sign of alarm. You should go and see what's going on because a baby should have its mouth closed all the time. We should be um, not nose breathers unless we are running or we're trying to escape the tiger. But if we're just resting, our mouth should be comfortably closed. If it's not, then that's a sign of alarm. It's the easiest sign for, for a parent to see. Uh, if you see children in the playground and their mouth is open while they're you know, waiting on the sidelines, then you know something is wrong. And the second thing is once you know something is wrong, do not accept the recommendation of waiting. Not from birth, not at one year, not at two, not at four, not at seven or eight. You go to the orthodontist and you see something is not developing properly and somebody tells you, wait, wait until all the teeth are in. Don't accept that advice. Do something immediately. Interestingly, uh, one of the things that Catlin reported the Native Americans is that when 
A, an Indian woman was nursing a baby. When she finished nursing, she always gently closed the lips of the infant. And interestingly enough, um, I met, having met uh, Sandra and David, uh, Michael Mew, who was uh, one of the uh, pioneers in working this thing out, the whole pattern. And his wife had just had a baby and was nursing it. And I noticed when she stopped nursing, the next thing she did was gently close the infant's lips. Don't wait is a very good rule. Another thing for you to remember always is that you, your dog, uh, the uh, protozoans that are living in your gut, all are a product of a genetic code and an environment. There is no such thing as an organism without an environment or an organism without some form of genetic code. And you can often, everything, it's like when people say, oh, this has to be all genes. It can't be all genes any more than the area of a rectangle can be all width. Uh, they're in completely tied together. And what we are seeing is uh, the product of genes and environment being changed very dramatically now in human beings by industrialization. The change is virtually entirely in the environment. That doesn't mean the genes aren't involved. It's just the same genes we had when we were in the Stone Age, and they react, they produce a different organism when they interact with an industrial environment. If we change the, the small little things like weaning and breathing properly and vigorously chewing, and um, what I want to talk a little bit about is posture. If we change our posture and we go back to having good muscle tone, then we are going to express that full map, genetic blueprint that we have, it's going to express itself to its maximum potential, and that is pre-programmed to be able to fit those wisdom teeth. So we don't need to have those wisdom teeth taken out, but we do need to plan ahead. We need to plan ahead to, to do this and to have the jaws grow during the time that they need to grow so that when the wisdom teeth come in, the room is there. Look, this is, in a sense, a public health problem. People are not informed of this problem. Healthcare uh, people are not informed. There are wonderful people who work very hard on trying to see that we get proper nutrition, which we often don't, uh, but virtually never mention. We've been unable to find in the literature a history of the toughness of food. Uh, so it's not just what you eat, it's how you eat it. But that's the kind of thing that can be fixed in school cafeterias, in radio shows, in television shows, uh, in the general knowledge uh, that people are taught uh, throughout their educational systems, uh, and the changes that are, are required are relatively simple. Don't eat smoothies. Eat yourself an apple. Uh, get something you got to chew on. Uh, this is particularly true for kids. With every, like everything else, uh, children are more susceptible to environmental change when they're developing. You give them the wrong cues when they're developing, it takes a hell of a lot, if it's even possible, to change it. Just imagine if you never let your uh, daughter uh, walk until she was 10, what her legs would be like. In other words, you, this is something where the general public has to be made aware enough so that if you see somebody else's child mouth breathing, you feel free to say, look, your mommy told you just like you don't smoke, you don't mouth breathe. Uh, you know, adults now, We've got a norm, uh, and they don't feel bad about uh, preventing uh, children from smoking or saying you're eating too much sugar, things like that. One of these days they're going to say, look, you're mouth breathing. You haven't been chewing enough, something like that. Uh, but it is a public health problem where we're not getting the support we need now, either from educational institutions or from the government. Well, I want to talk a little bit about posture, because posture um, in all my work uh, has come up as the one thing that we're not paying attention that we used to pay attention to. If you look at photographs from a hundred years ago, you can see that the, the way we would hold ourselves was different than the way we hold ourselves today. And our children with all those devices and you know their neck hunch over. And the oral posture is important too because to hold a certain posture you need to have muscle tone, you have to have certain strength on, in your muscles. And we are not teaching our kids 
how to have a proper oral posture. So when they hang their mouth open, they don't develop the strength. And you know, it's a, it's a visual circle because they're not chewing, so they don't have the strength. So their mouth just hangs open. And you know, that when we teach, uh, we have a program called the, the GOPEX, the Good Oral Posture Exercise Program. We teach them how to hold their jaws with the correct posture. And by changing posture, we're able to influence growth very, very deeply. And um, posture is how we hold our muscles long term, how we sleep. We, if we have certain posture, we keep that posture when we're not doing anything. Hormonally, we grow at night when we're sleeping. There's more growth when we're not doing things. Yeah, the main hormone that controls your growth is, is secreted much more at night than in the daytime. Uh, people don't understand, and there's some now better and better literature on this, how desperately important good sleep is to everything that you do, to your life expectancy. The posture thing is also a partly a public health problem. In other words, in our schools, uh, we don't design the chairs uh, to give children the best possible posture. Uh, so there, this can be worked on at all kinds of levels, and you can go complain to your school board if your kids don't have the right posture in their school chairs. They're, they're going to sit in those chairs for six hours a day. Uh, that's a long time uh, to have your development going in the wrong direction. Absolutely. Posture is something that we're not paying enough attention, and it's really going to cause a lot of misery in the future of our, our children because posture is not in the radar of adults. We are not, we're looking at kids and we're looking at their, their performance in school, their grades, their, all these activities, but we're not really paying attention to their posture. We're letting them you know, just sit in weird positions and we're very sedentary. Um, there's not a problem with being sedentary as long as we have a certain intention in our posture when we're not doing anything. Because our ancestors were very sedentary. They, they would do, they would have activity, but then they would sit a, long, a longer time. And, you know, if we sit properly and we hold ourselves with certain posture, then that, uh, that activity is going to be a time where we're going to be growing. Um, properly. If when we're sitting we have horrible posture, then we're not going to develop properly. And that will cause misery not only in your airway, but also in your back and you know there's there's every part of your body. And in your suffer. sleep. Take it from me, uh, how bad your back is <laughs> controls how well you sleep. Totally. Absolutely. Sleep is is, is um, catching a lot of attention in our society. There's fantastic literature. There's um, Matthew Walker's book that just came out, but very prominent people like Ariana Huffington, they've written books because they realize how important sleep is. And sleep problems, and, and they're linked to all kinds of health issues. And we are looking at not only the amount of time that you sleep, but the quality of your sleep. And you know, the, when you're mouth breathing, the quality of your rest is not going to be the same as if your mouth is, is shut, if your teeth are in light contact, if your muscles have light tone on them, then your rest is going to be a lot more yeah. um, successful. When do you naturally mouth breathe? Was, is when, as Sandra mentioned, if a lion happens to be chasing you, I don't know how many of you have been chased by lions recently, but you tend to mouth breathe. Uh, when a lion is chasing you. It turns on uh, what's sometimes called the, the flight or fight response, the so-called sympathetic nervous system, the part of your autonomic nervous system that deals with catastrophes and so on, not with relaxation. Uh, but if you're mouth breathing, what, one of the things we don't know where we need more research is how much mouth breathing turns on the sympathetic nervous system at least at a low level all the time. One of the things we do know is if the longer you keep your sympathetic nervous system turned on when there's no lion chasing you, the more likely you are to die of cancer or of heart disease or lots of other things. So we still don't understand everything that we need to know about this system because, of course, it's really tough to study. I mean, as a scientist, I can tell you most of the stuff we've been talking about depends on so-called retrospective studies. That is, you find a bunch of people uh, who have sleep apnea and you can ask them how much their mother nursed them and what they were weaned to. And who among you has any clue how much your mother nursed you or what you were weaned to? 
The, the gold standard in scientific studies are prospective studies. That is, you take a hundred kids and you make their mothers breastfeed them for four years and wean them to hard foods and you take another hundred kids and you bottle feed them and wean them to uh, uh, baby foods that are soup and you see what happens over the next 70 years. Turns out those are kind of difficult studies to get a range. You need a lot of money and so on. So we're not able, we have to put together all kinds of clues from the retrospective studies, from anecdotes, from clinical studies. Uh, one of our things that our book is full of is results of clinical studies. Uh, those things are just as scientific as experiments. They're just different ways of approaching the same thing. When you think about it, the whole thing we're discussing is a huge, what we would call, natural experiment. You took thousands of groups of hunter-gatherers, and you took some of them, and you got them and moved them over a great deal of time, over hundreds of thousands of years, into an industrial society. When you do that, guess what? You have a natural experiment. You see that the ones going into the industrial society get smaller jaws, and in fact, it happens so fast you can look at families where grandson, grandpa uh, moved into uh, the industrial society when he was 80 and his jaw's just fine. But grandson moved in when he was three and his jaw is going to hell. So there's lots of ways that science tells us what we're telling you is right, but we still could use more scientific information. Uh, for example, we would be lovely to have a record through Western history of how tough the foods were, how fast people started eating the softer foods. You have clues from when uh, grinders were invented and when people started using utensils, which is a big deal, and so on, but we really don't have the data we'd love to have. Well, we do have some um, anthropological and archaeological data, and we know that a lot of these old skulls of remains that we see from pre-industrial era before we, we domesticated agriculture, we can see that all their teeth are in. There's no crowding, the jaws are fairly big, and wisdom teeth have a lot of room. So we know we've, we've worked with uh, anthropologists that have held you know, a lot of yeah. you know, skulls, dry skulls, and they've looked at it, and it's very rare to find crowding in ancient uh, remains. Yeah, my, my close colleague <coughs> Richard Klein is the top uh, paleoanthropologist, the person who knows more about the skeletal history of human beings than anyone else. And he told us, he said, look, I've never held a pre-industrial skull, a hunter-gatherer skull that had crooked teeth. Just malocclusion, which is the fancy name for crooked teeth, uh, just don't basically occur. There are a few rare cases reported. Interestingly enough, they're so rare that when somebody finds one, they write it up because it's so unusual for a hunter-gatherer uh, to have crooked teeth. The stress expert, uh, Robert Sapolsky, he said something about, in one of his books, he said that when the, when the antelope is getting chased by the, by the lion, they don't have time to grow their antlers. So if they are being chased, they are not going to um, set aside resources in order to grow. And this is what we think that children are doing when they're uh, mouth breathing. We know that when your mouth is open, your saliva dries up. And saliva is one of the first things that happens when you're stressed, when you're being chased by a bandit or somebody, then your mouth dries up immediately. Or, or if you're scared, your, your saliva dries up immediately. So we know that these kids are drying up their mouth. So that's a, a sign and we can tell that they're going through some extra stress. If we can close their mouth, then their mouth will not be dry and they will have less stress, they will grow better. So these are all observations that we can put together um, anecdotally and eventually we're, we're gonna call in for more experiments, more research, but right now we know enough through what these experts in different fields have um, brought to the, to the scientific literature to be able to confidently report and, and make these recommendations for, for growing children. Yeah, you don't need the final super experiment in many cases that are very important to humanity, particularly the broad scale issues. For example, we know for sure that we're changing the climate. 
We don't know exactly what changes are going to occur in various places. We have some pretty good ideas, but it, to wait until you know exactly what the changes are going to be in individual places, uh, it's kind of like knowing which room is going to burn first uh, and waiting until you find out which room is going to burn first before you call the fire department. Uh, so we know things that we need to do now. Uh, and that is not going to give you perfect treatment, but there is no such thing as perfect treatment. Remember, above all else, uh, people are very variable. Some people may be able to hang their mouth open longer than some others and still have their jaws come in pretty well. Uh, there is genetic variation that you, you always have to think about. Uh, but what we're talking about is, I think, as solid as you can get with the mass of evidence we have. I, read about 500 papers in the dental literature in, when we were working on the book. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm convinced that there's more than enough there to support what we have. You, all you really need is the data from excavating cemeteries and finding out that 300 years ago, Danish men uh, had larger jaws than Danish men today. Uh, that tells you right away that there's an environmental thing going on that affects your jaws because 300 years ago is only 10 or 15 generations. That's not enough. That wouldn't be enough time to change the size of the jaws of Danish men significantly if you killed 50% of the ones that had big jaws. In other words, there's no selection pressure that's going to make that kind of genetic change in that kind of time. Well, I think this has given you a little bit of an overview of uh, the epidemic that we're talking about. And if you have any questions, we're happy to entertain them right now. Yeah, what do you think? <laughs>